there was chaos at the school and everybody was screaming and running because uh, they didn't know what is happening. This one guy shouted, run away, he's mad. And then Jock stopped and he looked. The school actually didn't care about it until that day. He made himself being noticed that day. The town of Krugersdorp, not far from the economic hub of Johannesburg, a town that's past its heyday. Many of its residents have fallen on hard times. A cloud of depression seems to have settled on this once prosperous mining town. It was in this setting that a teenage boy would do something so horrific, so unexpected, and so cold-blooded that Krugersdorp would forever be marked as the backdrop for one of South Africa's most violent crimes. Even more shocking was that it happened in the sanctuary of school grounds. He liked swords from, a ch from childhood on. He liked swords. His father bought them for him. So they, they were quite open in the house. They were like swords you collect from the flea markets, things like that. And he sharpened them specifically for that day. That day was the 18th of August, 2008. It was a Monday. 18-year-old Mornay Haramsa and his friends had left school on the Friday before with plans to bring weapons to school the following week. The group of misfits wanted to be noticed by their fellow pupils. They had all kinds of bizarre suggestions. Some of them said they must build a bomb. Others said they'll bring firearms to the school. They were even mention of a bloodbath. What started out as a schoolboy prank turned into a rampage. On the Monday, the accused then went to school with three swords, gloves, knee guards, and elbow guards, as well as black paint, and three homemade masks. These masks were masks of the band Slipknot. It's a heavy metal band. Mornay Harams's obsession with swords was about to turn deadly. Just prior to the starting of the school, the accused then told the people, his friends, that you want to see something cool now? Just wait. When the bell rings, something cool will happen. They laughed him off. They thought he was joking. He then started to make his face black. Then he put on the mask, the one with the dreadlocks. Then he put on the elbow guards, the knee guards, as well as gloves. He also put on a belt and two of the swords he was wearing on the back of his, at his, at his back. And the other one, a samurai sword he was having in his hand. And then he told the, his friends that when the bell rings, it will start. And then he realized that his friends thought he, he, he's a joker and whatever. He got angry. They didn't want to wear the mask. They didn't want to partake in, in his plan anymore. One of his friends also put on a mask, a clown mask but later took it off and put it down, and he also put the sword that the accused gave him down. So he distanced him totally from what is going to happen. The first unfortunate learner to cross his path, Jacques Pretorius, and he didn't even know him. This one guy shouted, run away, he's mad. And then Jacques stopped and he looked back, and I also looked back, and as Jacques looked down, pulled out a sword and he slipped out from the back. He fell down immediately and he died there on the scene. The accused then walked further up the passage 
the passage was full of children as it, the bell went already and everybody had to go to their points. And he came across another bloke. The victim was Stefan Bauer, and he also chopped him with a sword. Fortunately for Stefan, he only chopped him higher up on the skull, so although he was also seriously injured, and the damage was not the same, and the injury was not that fatal, he survived after a, an emergency operation. Then two of the workers of the school also crossed his path. He also chopped at them. Two groundsmen, Lesiba Manamela and Shiama Kodasang, had seen what was happening and approached Taramsa to try and stop his attack. Manamela suffered a stab wound to his elbow and Kodasang was cut on his face. He then walked further to the square where all the pupils are supposed to meet. He sat on a little wall there and he stuck the sword into the ground in front of him. At that stage, it was chaos at the school and everybody was screaming and running because uh, they didn't know what is happening. One of the teachers then confronted him and told him to follow him to the headmaster's office. He complied. Paramedics and the police arrived, but for Jacques Pretorius, it was too late. He had detailed drawings of the school. Something was going to happen, and it did on that day in 2008. So Mornay planned it. I don't think he, he thought it through well enough, you know, to be something like Columbine or, you know, the overseas school shooting incidents, things like that. It was the spur of the moment there thing that he did. Traumatized pupils were given counseling. Sixteen-year-old Jacques Pretorius was buried four days later. Hundreds of learners attended to pay their last respects. I was on leave. I was on long study leave at the time when the story broke in, in the media. So I went back to Stadfontein Hospital because I was the senior psychologist of the forensic unit at the time. I went back early from leave because he was being referred for observation to Stadfontein Psychiatric Hospital. I was asked by the police to just to come and uh, establish whether Satanism played a role in the specific murder. Of course, many satanic paraphernalia were found I collected some of the paraphernalia, the books that were written, some of the masks and stuff and the swords all were there. And then eventually I established that, that Satanism was involved. I would say more on the dabbling side. I won't say it was a direct cause, but I think in a way along the road it played a role. I think Monet was looking for meaning. He was looking for attention he was looking for a lot of things and he used satanistic rituals he used alternative spiritual avenues he used wicca he used all kinds of things he wanted to to make drugs he was unsuccessful he wanted to be a satanist he was unsuccessful he wanted to do astral travel he was unsuccessful he was unsuccessful in everything he did Mornay Haramsa had been an outsider at school, and there were reports of bullying. He was bullied at school. He wanted retaliation, he wanted revenge. There were no real evidence that uh, bullying caused uh, this whole incident. It was mentioned made uh, that there was a degree of bullying. How severe it was, uh, it was never placed before court, and uh, it was never, I was never informed that there was severe bullying. Also. If we look at the, the plea explanation given by Haramsa, uh, at no stage was the court informed in his plea explanation that he went there for revenge. The reasoning for them to commit this crime, this crime was to look for attention. The media had a field day on, on that aspect, but during the trial and during our consultations, that never came to the fore. What I can assume, and I don't want to speculate, but the accused was a 
a tender guy with a boyish face. He looked like still a younger boy. So maybe that was one of the reasons why he wanted to show that he was actually a matric guy. We also need to take into consideration what the things are that the South African society rewards, what we value. And you know, when you talk of this particular case and when you talk of that he was a small person for his age, etc., in South Africa we reward and we value strength, physical strength, we value sport, we value boldness and often bullies are rewarded within a school context. Mona was definitely bullied as a child in his school career, and it left significant emotional scars for him in terms of how he would relate to his peers. For any child, being bullied, you know, leaves permanent scars that they carry with them till the day that they die. The schools don't do anything, and, and the parents of the bullies are not prepared to do anything, you know. So it's up to usually the parents of the child who's being bullied to do something, to take a stand. In Mornay's case, it became clear he came from a dysfunctional family. I would say he had a very low self-esteem. I don't think he had, he had a much backup from his parents. I had a feeling that they don't care about what this boy is doing. Because if you get all this stuff in the house, in the rooms and stuff, I understood that he actually locked his room when he went up to school, that he doesn't leave his room open for no one to go there. The father is the primary role model in, in the household for a boy. And Mona had a very difficult relationship with his father. His father is quite a strict disciplinarian, but also prone to aggression. And the altercations that he had with Mona sometimes got physical. He got a bad rap from his father, a really bad, bad relationship and bad experiences from his father. I can't blame his father. I can't say that his father is to blame. But I do think that his father carries a large proportion of, of some kind of responsibility for Mornay's life, for Mornay's actions, Mornay's thoughts, you know, how Mornay engages with the world, you know. He saw from how his parents engaged with the world. Um, and that's very unfortunate. Due to the bizarre circumstances of this case, we thought it good to get a psychiatric report concerning his mental state. He was then sent for observation in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act, Section 77 and 78 of the Criminal Procedure Act, for 30 days a mental observation at Sterkfontein Hospital. The observation period was extended for another 30 days. The unanimous report from Stagfontein Hospital was that he was not mentally ill and that he was able to stand trial and uh, conduct his own affairs. But the whole time when he was there for the initial 30 days, I was very confused because something didn't gel, something didn't match. He was psychotic, but yet not like the psychotic people I know, schizophrenics and the like. Um, and then I asked the head of the unit to please extend the, the, the observation for another 30 days. And that's when the mom actually came to see um, me and, and the head of the unit. And she came out and said, yes, there were conduct features, there were theft in the past. He was aggressive and violent. She was always thinking he had a criminal mind, um, things like that. Then everything came out. I confronted him with that. I said to him, you're giving us a facade here, you're not psychotic, there's nothing wrong with you. He freely admitted it. Mornay Halimsa had been a ticking time bomb, but the signs had been ignored until it was too late. During the trial, the Halimsas appeared to be a loving family, but evidence suggested otherwise. This was a very unfortunate case because he comes from a very dysfunctional family. And when I did my investigation at the time, I went to the school and asked his school file. You know, the file that follows you from grade one all the way through to high school. And most of the progress reports and progress forms were blank. They weren't filled in. And I actually sat in the headmaster's office and I thought to myself, you know what? 
why wasn't there intervention earlier on in this case? Because the signs were there. They were clear as daylight. They saw that that was there. The, the school actually didn't care about it until that day. He made himself being noticed that day. He said to the world, now take notice of me, because no one ever took notice of him. In April 2009, Mornay Haramsa pleaded guilty to one count of murder and three counts of attempted murder. He was convicted on all four counts. I think if you are predisposed, it's like a recipe. If you are predisposed genetically, and then you have environmental factors that play in with it, it's a recipe for disaster. If a child has the opportunity to develop skills, to deal with that, to deal with bullies, etc., within the home environment, whether it's um, speaking to the parents or a school counsellor or a psychologist, that will assist the child, that will facilitate the development of coping skills, of strategies to cope with being bullied. This sounds very critical towards Mr. and Mrs. Armsa, but if they were proper parents, more adequate parents, they would have noticed these things, but they were suffering from terrible marital difficulties and violence in the house. So they didn't notice the children. They were just on the sideline. We live in a violent country. We live in a violent world. It's a global problem. And children do what they see. Children learn what they see and they learn what they hear. For the family of victim Jacques Pretorius, they could never understand why Mornay Haramsa had embarked on such a horrific attack against a boy he didn't even know. Plus, plus, and that's more. Yeah, that's not even more enough. There must be more, you know. None of the victims, uh, there was any evidence that they bullied him. In fact, the accused went so far as to when the, the first victim was killed, he did not even know his name. He later learned the name of, of the first victim. So he was, he, he was unknown to him. He was just another scholar in the school. In September 2009, the Johannesburg High Court sentenced Mornay Haramsa to 20 years behind bars. It's hard, so it's heartbreaking. It's, I don't know, I can't express my feelings. It's, it, it's just too much. It's overwhelming. It's, it's very difficult. Mornay Haramsa showed no remorse throughout his trial. He was very unemotional, almost blunt. He sat in the accused box, showing no emotion whatever. Whenever any evidence was presented, photo albums of the deceased, photo albums of the scene, he sat there emotionless. That was strange, he, he showed, that he showed no emotion whatsoever, not even crying. The only emotion he would show was during a break when he would go to his father and mother and they will then embrace each other and talk to each other. That's the only time there will be some slight sign of any emotion. I can tell you that, that the parents, I think, got a wake-up call of note. I do not know if they're still married. I do not know that today. I don't know. But they got a wake-up call at the time. They were very shocked, you know very emotional, over-emotional. You could see that they now realized that things were desperately wrong in the household. Haramsa's parents, Machil and Liza, attended all of his court appearances and publicly stood by their son. They have maintained contact with him. It seemed at the time that Mona was very close to his mom, especially, you know, and, and that, that his mom was kind of silenced by the father to not say things or not say things open in public and, and withhold information. 
The father was the main controlling figure in the household. The mother was very subservient, although, you know, they had their fights, bad fights between the two of them, marital difficulties. And the mom had her own struggles, suicidal attempts, etc. But the mom especially would have remained in contact with Mona because she felt very emotional. presents with different facades so you will have a very timid very sensitive very tiny puny little boy actually you won't think he's 18 years old or 19 years old or 20 years old however old he is now even now he looks like a young boy but a calculating person a manipulative person like you like you won't believe a risk for violence. He remains a risk for violence. I don't know what happened to him in prison, what he was exposed to, what he was taught. So for me, in my mind, yes, he remains a risk, period. When he comes out, he will need close monitoring and supervision. I won't trust him to just be in the community. I'm sorry. I won't say you, you, you're never safe, but we deal with human factors. And once you deal with human factors, you never know what the next human is going to do. From very early on in his life, he learned how to manipulate and change his facade and his personality to suit him. You know, I would go with the saying, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, for Mornay specifically. Mm -hmm. 